today's episode of the SSPX podcast, we'll continue our apologetic series by furthering our understanding on one of the more complex issues dividing various Christian denominations, predestination. We know that God knows all things, so he knows whether we will achieve our own salvation. So why does it matter whether we do anything for our own justification if God already knows the outcome? Protestants will further say that we can't help with our own salvation because we are so damaged by original sin. So what's the answer to all of these questions? You can find notes to all of these episodes at sspxpodcast.com slash apologetics, as well as all of our previous episodes. There as well, you can find a link to help support this project. This is free to listen to, as well as all of the resources we're posting, but if you can help with a one-time or a small monthly recurring donation, you'll be making sure that we can continue this work of providing good Catholic content on a regular basis. So now let's join Father Jonathan Loop for episode number 30 on our apologetic series. Father Loop, it is great to have you back again for our next episode on the apologetic series. How are you doing right now? I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be back. Absolutely. Pleasure to have you back. And uh, thanks again for taking the time to uh, put some things together for us. Today, we're going to be looking at the concept of faith and works. Uh, but just so that we can kind of get an idea of where we ended last time to kind of have a clean transition into the next episode here, uh, can we just take a quick recap on what we saw last time with original sin? For sure. So, and that's important because I think as we saw last time, the Protestant take on a relig- uh, original sin is really going to lead into this whole question of faith and works, how they understood it, at least initially. Um, and what we saw was that, to again simplify a little bit for the moment, is that Luther and after him Calvin and many of the other reformers believed that when Adam and Eve fell, it was so catastrophic that it fundamentally annihilated human nature to the extent that human beings cannot do any good action of any kind. Every movement that now proceeds from this fundamentally broken nature is displeasing to God. And that's going to have huge consequences when we come to look at this idea of justification. You know, really, that's going to be the heart of the matter between the church and these um, revolters, ultimately. So, again, that's just a very basic summary, but. Sure. So, we are going to be. I, I guess before we kind of dive into this, are we going to be, it, it's kind of impossible to look at one Protestant um, dogma right. or one Protestant idea about these because there are many different ones. So are mm-hmm. we going to be kind of looking at a historical uh, view of how Lutherans looked at it at first, or are you kind of taking an amalgamation of all the different Protestant ideas? How are you going to be approaching this, Father? That's fair. No, I think the best way to do this um, is to really try to look at some of the texts um, that were from Luther or from Calvin, because ultimately, um, well, anything, any institution is going to be fundamentally marked by its institution. So to understand Protestantism, even though it may have diverged in many different levels, um, it's really important to go back to its beginnings, you know, and that's going to help us to give the context. Even okay, yeah, even sometimes when more modern Protestants may have rejected in part or in whole that they're so marked by it. Okay. So we're going to be talking about what's called the joint declaration. What is, what is this joint declaration? So that document, um, and again, it's just, I thought it was going to be a good way to introduce into the topic. That was something that was published by a commission that was composed of Catholic theologians and Lutheran theologians primarily in the late 1990s. And which is, part and parcel of the whole ecumenical movement. Let's have dialogue. Let's talk. Let's basically, let's talk through our differences and see if we can come to some common understanding. And, you know, so in effect, this, this was the culmination of those dialogues, those discussions, and in which there was an effort made to say, okay, look, um, now we Catholics and Protestants are more or less on the same page. And where there was differences in the past, we can kind of paper over them. It's fine. 
Interestingly enough, um, in fact, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith published a document after this came out saying, okay, look, there's actually still some fundamental differences and we can't simply pretend we're on the same page, which is, which is interesting. Though the conclusion of that later document, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, um, called for more dialogue as opposed to like, you all need to convert. <laughs> so anyways. Right. So maybe just as an introduction, one of the comments that was made in that, um, again, from this joint declaration by the Catholics and Lutherans on justification, um, is that opposing interpretations and applications of the biblical message of justification were in the 16th century a principal cause of the division of the Western Church and led as well to doctrinal condemnations. Of course, there they're referring to the Council of Trent on the Catholic side and then things like the Augsburg Confession or the Book of Concord on the Protestant side. And then they end by saying a common understanding of justification is therefore fundamental and indispensable to overcoming that division. You know, so basically... Effectively, if there's going to be any progress in their minds, trying to come to that unity and diversity in the modern ecumenical mindset, then we have to kind of have some common ground on justification. Um, Mm -hmm. And so they they say elsewhere in that same um, document uh, that like the dialogues themselves, this joint declaration rests on the conviction that in overcoming the earlier controversial questions and doctrinal condemnations, the churches neither take the condemnations lightly, nor do they disavow their own past. It's it's great. It's very, it's doublespeak in a sense. Like, we're no longer bound by these, but we don't reject them, of course. We just pretend like we've changed them. And it says, on the contrary, this declaration is shaped by the conviction that in their respective histories, our churches, Catholic, so to speak, Lutheran church, although that's really a wrong way of speaking, have come to new insights. Developments have taken place which not only make possible, but also require the churches to examine the divisive questions and condemnations and then see them in a new light. Basically, perhaps one way of thinking about that is, you know, the new developments, say on the Catholic side or Vatican II, this idea that we can have an adjournamento, um, and therefore, we can re-envision these things from the past in such a way that they're no longer applicable, fundamentally. Okay. So that being said, again, that's just to give a, con- give a context to the importance of the question. I mean, I think there's grave, grave uh, issues with that document. However, I do think it's correct in highlighting the fact that, all right, much of the issue focuses or revolves around this question of justification which, as I said, was tied to that notion of original sin. Now, at this point, it might be good to look at, okay, what do we mean when we speak of the term justification? And actually, let me ask you, I mean, just in a very day-to-day sense, like what comes to your mind when you hear this terminology, which I would presume is not something that gets bandied about your house on a regular basis? No, I mean, I guess the main the main way I would use it is to justify myself, meaning to defend myself. Um, oh, we're not okay. necessarily talking about that, though. Uh, I think in more the theological sense, the first thing that comes to my mind is is uh, colloquially, how do I get right with the Lord? You know, okay. it's it's yep. how do I how do I make myself uh, become pleasing to God? That's how I understand it as a Catholic, at least. Okay, yeah, I think that's good. I think, in fact, both what you said there, both are more prosaic. Like, yeah, I justify myself. And I think it's good that you said that because in a sense, I think that actually captures in a way the Protestant critique of Catholicism in the way in the, from the point of view of, okay, look from Luther's point of view or from Calvin's point of view, Catholics are saying, I justify myself. I make myself right before God. And that's can't, that's Mm -hmm. impossible. Okay. And then, yeah, the more theological thing our definition that you're giving there is is good and I think can serve as a starting point for, let's say, the two sides or two aspects of uh, justification that would be good to consider. So in the first place, um, when we speak of justification, um, it comes from a Latin term, justus, uh, yeah, justus facere, to make just. 
And therefore, we can say it's the process by one it when, by which one is taken from a state of injustice and moved to a state of justice. Okay. Now, so we'll start there, but just real quickly, and then we'll come back to this. But a second aspect of justification is, well, what is the end result of that? What does it mean, in fact, for in our situation for man to be just or right with the Lord, as you put it? Like, What does that mean? So we have the movement and then we have the goal. Okay, and those are the two sides of it. And really, when we look at uh, the issue that arose on Luther's side, and therefore a lot of the Protestants that followed him, what we're going to, I think, have to understand is that the fundamental question that he was answering in a way that the church, um, in a way contrary to the way that the church would do so, um, was focused on can man cooperate in this process in any meaningful way? Does he will in some manner this justification and a, a corollary mm-hmm. to that question is does man have free will by means of which he can truly be said to choose for or against god and his grace you know that's in okay. a way that's the heart of everything that separated the church or well let's put it this way that separated luther from the church of christ you know mm-hmm. is how he answers that question and I think as a, as a, maybe as a beginning point here, it's, an, it's critical to understand that the question is not whether God initiates the process of man's justification. Because um, sometimes, you know, that's, um, that's a misunderstanding on part of some Protestants of the Catholic position, because frankly, the church is very emphatically clear that God alone takes the first step in drawing us to himself. The man can do nothing of himself to invite or to merit the first grace that God gives. Um, Okay. You know, so that's not the issue. The question is rather, once God takes that first step, can man say yes? And as a result, choose to be justified. Now, um, this is where it's important to understand that Protestant, or at least for the early Protestants, their notion of original sin. For them, remember, man's nature is wholly corrupted. And every movement of man's will is therefore fundamentally at its root, radically evil, you know, at the very root, and opposed to the will of God. And that's going to lead them to conclude that it is fundamentally impossible for man to cooperate with that initial grace of God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, for that to understand, let's let's. I'll quote a, a gentleman that I quoted last time again, a more recent writer. It's his own website named John Piper, and he simply quotes Lutheran, saying that this is my absolute opinion. He that will maintain that man's a man's free will is able to do or work anything in spiritual cases, be they never so small, denies Christ. This I've always maintained in my writings, especially in those against Erasmus, you know, who was a Catholic humanist at the time and who engaged in some polemics with Luther. The point is, if he can do anything to cooperate with God, it nullifies the work of Christ. Because that implies that man is doing something positively that our Lord doesn't need to, to do. And to develop that, I can read a few more um, passages, firstly from Luther. And this first one um, comes from his, uh, again, from that same polemic with Erasmus, talking about the, f- the freedom of the human will. And he writes that, this is Luther again. Thus, the human will is placed as a sort of pack horse in the midst of two contending parties. If God hath mounted, it wills and goes whither God pleases, as the psalmist says, and become as a beast of burden, and I am ever with thee. If Satan, on the other hand, hath mounted, it wills and goes wherever Satan wills. Nor is it in its own choice to which of the two riders it shall run or to seek its rider. But the riders themselves contend for the acquisition and possession of it. 
you know, if you think about that, <laughs> you know, man is simply at the behest of forces outside his control. And he has no mm-hmm. agency in determining which of those is going to have a, um, a say in the matter. You know, some, I think later Protestants would claim that, okay, that, that's written in the heat of a argument and it's over emphasizes Luther's position. But what I would say is actually, I mean, fundamentally and logically, that is where Luther would have to arrive. If man cannot contribute anything, then fundamentally that is his situation. You know, he's, right. um, whether he's under the influence of God or whether he's un- under the influence of Satan, he just follows whatever they do. Would it be fair to say that the the Protestant idea of man's position in terms of his justification is similar to the Catholic understanding of uh, a soul once they're in purgatory, absolutely unable to do anything of of their own in order to merit their their ascension back into heaven? It is just you're you're relying on outside forces, and and the the Protestants would say further that that intercession from someone else is not possible either. But right. is that sort of an analogy where? We're just kind of stuck. There's, there's nothing okay. we can do. I think that's a good question. And I think it helps to clarify because, in fact, n- no, I don't think there's a parallel in the sense that for soul in purgatory, they're there freely. Actually, they choose, in a sense, to be there so long as it's necessary to cooperate with God to purify their soul. So, it's, in fact, it's not like they're in this passive state. They're actively collaborating with God's purification of them, even at that point, um, you know, they're not, they cannot, what all we mean when we say that a person in purgatory cannot change their position is they cannot any longer merit. And they're no longer in a position of uh-huh. meriting an additional reward um, because that time has okay. passed and that's limited to this life because at that point, there's no longer the principal merit. Uh, well, I mean, I, let me take that back. The principal merit is there, the charity, but they've already had that judgment, you know, which sets them in a definitive okay. state. And now what they're doing in purgatory is merely um, being purified and paying the debt due to, let's say, some of their their disordered choices in life. But they're still there willingly. Okay. And they're freely undergoing so, that. So the Protestant view is so the Protestant view is even more, so to speak, helpless. Oh, there, yeah. There's nothing man can do. We are, we're totally at the whims of, we're, we're like dandelion fluff. <laughs> yeah. You know, so to speak. I mean, quite literally, you know, it's, yeah. if we go back to the, that quote from the ed- sermon of Jonathan Edwards that we began last podcast with, God holds you soul over the pits of hell. And he looks at you like a little uh, spider because of the horrors that you are to him as a result of original sin. That spider holding on that yeah. uh, string can't do anything. He's entirely dependent on what the choice of the person is holding them over the flames. Um, again, we're talking about the um, the doctrine as such. Uh, it's a very inhuman doctrine, and so we can't be surprised if a lot of Protestants don't follow it through to those logical conclusions um, in their own lives, and even when they think about it, it's, it's hard for them to really be honest and say, this is what that means. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I would think it would be good in, uh, to, to quote one or two more passages here going back to that joint declaration, because it just lays out in certain instances what the Lutherans believed. In the first place, so this is from the fourth section of it. So it's broken into various sections, kind of going through different aspects of the discussions. But here it talks about, okay, what happens in this justification? And there they write, according to Lutheran teaching, human beings are incapable of cooperating in their salvation. Because as sinners, they actively oppose God and his saving action. Okay, so they can't cooperate. They can't say yes. Because, as it says, they are active. They are sinners and actively opposed. Every single motion of their will is opposed to God. And they, they, they go on. Lutherans do not deny that a person can reject the working of grace. For in fact, that's <laughs> every Lutheran do, or every human being does by definition. And, but then they go on when they emphasize that a person can only receive mere passive justification. Mm-hmm. 
They mean thereby to exclude any possibility of contributing to one's own justification, but do not deny that believers are fully involved personally in their faith, which is affected by God's word. So it sounds, again, when they say that they are fully involved, it has to be seen in the light of this comment of Luther, like they're just a, a chariot being or a horse being ridden by a rider. They can't oppose the rider, but they're involved because the horse is going where the rider wants it to go. Ultimately. Right. Um, and of course, all that leaves is an arbitrary choice of God. That's why Calvin was very, very logical. He said, okay, well, look, that's therefore there's predestination. God chooses arbitrarily or according to his wisdom, however you wish to put it, but without respect to the merits, the choice of any individual human being, where they go for all eternity. You know, you basically are dealing with two alternatives. Either man says yes, or it's an arbitrary choice of God. It's really what it comes down to. Um, and again, quoting a little bit later, that same joint declaration. Uh, there we read, Lutherans intend to express that justification remains free from human cooperation and is not dependent on the life renewing effects of grace in human beings. You know, they say it in a very kind of optimistic manner, but what that means is you can't, you can't work out your salvation. You cannot choose to accept God's offer of, um, of salvation ultimately. And that has huge consequences ultimately. Now, after having seen that, it might be good just briefly to look at the Catholic understanding of this. And to do the, to do that, um, firstly, I think it'd be good to quote St. Thomas Aquinas, who obviously is a theologian, gives the most, um, we may say, according to the judgment of the church, the authoritative statement on these matters. And he, in the first part of the Summa, in the 113th question, writes that the justification of the ungodly is brought about by God moving man to justice. So there it goes back to the point, like for Catholics, God takes the first step. No, there's no doubt about that. It's a free gift in a way that he invites us to become just in his eyes. St. Thomas continues, for he it is that, quote, justifieth the ungodly, according to Romans 4, 5. Now God moves, and here's the point, you know, and it's ultimately and very deeply means what St. Thomas is going to lay out is this idea that grace builds on nature. Now, God moves everything in its own manner. Just as we see that in natural things, what is heavy and what is light are moved differently. So a heavy rock is going to be uh, moved differently than air or fire. They go in different directions on account of their diverse natures. Hence, he moves man to justice according to the condition of his human nature. But it is man's proper nature to have free will. Hence, in him who has the use of reason, God's motion to justice does not take place without a movement of the free will. But he so infuses the gift of justifying grace that at the same time, he moves the free will to accept the gift of grace in, his, in such as are capable of being moved in this way. So in other words, God invites, and in that invitation, he gives the capacity for the free will to say yes, but it's still a true act of that free will by which that person accepts what's being offered. A little bit later in that same question, He'll write, hence the human mind, while it is being justified, must by a movement of its free will withdraw from sin and draw near to justice. It's, it's interesting. I just did a baptism this last weekend, and it's, it's a beautiful ceremony, but the whole ceremony, in fact, mirrors what he's just talking about there. Because at the beginning of the ceremonies, the whole emphasis of the church is on driving away, firstly, the devil, of course. So you have the exorcisms and the baptism, that external mm -hmm. draw to sin. But also that um, exhortation on the part of the child to reject sin. Do you, in fact, that leads up to those 
uh, baptismal vows. Do you renounce Satan? Tack, 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 tack. Do you reject yeah. all these evil things? And the church has done her part by driving the devil out and by inviting you. Do you second that? Once the child has done that, the next step is this movement towards God. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in his son? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like those three questions. And once the child through the godparents has made that act, that movement of the free will in the person of their uh, godparents of withdrawing from sin and drawing near to justice, then they're baptized. Right. So there is that act of participation that you, you must make that choice. You must move forward in that way on your right. own terms. Right. Yeah. And just to finish that passage from St. Thomas, he says, to withdraw from sin and to draw near to Justin in an act of free will means detestation of sin and desire of eternal life. For Augustine says on the words, the hireling fleeth from St. John's gospel, our emotions are the movements of our soul. Joy is a soul's outpouring. When somebody is happy, when they're joyful, that you can see there's just an abundance of energy that they have. Fear is the soul's flight. Your soul goes forward when you seek. Your soul flees when you are afraid. Hence, in the justification of the ungodly, there must be two acts of the free will. One by, one whereby it tends to God's justice, the other whereby it hates sin. You know, so, I mean, it, very simply, again, that's the Catholic teaching. Then, um, perhaps to really clarify that, just to come back now to the Council of Trent, which, of course, is where you're going to have the most thematic discussion of this on as far as an official and doctrinal teaching on the part of the church. Um, um, in fact, sorry, let me pull it up here real quick. So this is in chapter five of the sixth session. So the sixth session is dedicated solely to this whole question of justification. It goes through in a lot of detail, much more so than we need to go through right now. But um, in this chapter five, it indicates that it basically the church reiterates that man cooperates with this positively. He's not just a rag doll being driven around by um, exterior forces. So the church declares, moreover, the beginning of justification itself in adults is from God through Jesus Christ by means of a prevenient grace, which is a technical term meaning a grace that comes before anything that man does. That is, from his vocation, from God's vocation, by which man is called by none of his existing, pre-existing merits. That those who are turned away from their sins by God, by his grace exciting them and helping them to convert themselves to their own justification, and by freely assenting and cooperating with that grace, they are so disposed with God touching the heart of man through the Holy Ghost illuminating that it's neither man so completely by himself that acts, receiving that inspiration. Nevertheless, he can reject that. Never and nor, uh, nor uh, without, um, nor can he move himself without the grace of God to that justice by his own free will. So, from the point of view of the church, God has to draw us. He has to invite us. It's a, it's a great mystery of the goodness of God. But with that grace, he gives the human being that ability to, as it said, to assent, to say yes, and to cooperate, to, to work with, you know, that grace of God. Which is, you know, has, well, we can, we'll see in a moment, huge ramifications because that means, well, and that leads us, in fact, to the, the next point here. What is the end result of this process of justification? What happens when a man is made just in the eyes of God? 
So here, so the fundamental question initially is, can man cooperate? Here, it's going to be, is man made good? Or rather, mm -hmm. is he merely reputed to be good? Right. And go ahead. I was just going to say, that's that's a fundamental question that Catholics have, have been wrestling with uh, for centuries, right? Are, at, at our core, are we good or are we uh, flawed? Well, yeah. That's still I mean, a question it's a, that many Catholics ask. Well, yeah, it's just a human question because you see all these you know, yeah. say positive powers that man possesses and you see man doing a lot of really terrible things. You know, it's like, well, what's going on? You know, and not only that, um, but you see that on the societal level and you see that on um, individual level. There's a great quote um, you may have yeah. read from Alexander Solzhenitsyn that comes in his gulag or capelago. So he was obviously arrested for writing letters, criticizing Stalin's policy. That didn't go over well. So he got sent to the gulag. And, you know, he, he was a committed communist at the time. And therefore, he had a communist outlook on good and evil. Meaning that, and we're going to maybe touch on that briefly at the end today, that um, basically good and evil, men are good or evil, based on the societal arrangement they deal with. And those that are, um, let's say, not shaped by a societal um, structure that, com say, that communism can provide and are opposed to it are evil, fundamentally. It's just this class of people that are evil, and they need to be wiped out, um, potentially, if they can't be reformed. Um, and, and he comes to a realization after dealing with fellow prisoners and you know, a lot of reflection. He's like, ah, it came to me at last that the line dividing good and evil runs through the heart of every man <laughs> and it's constantly shifting, you know, and it's, it's a sh shift back. Okay. Look, there, there, there is a, well, ultimately man has a choice in whether he's good or not. He has to face that choice, let's say, and how he reacts, right. how he decides is going to shape who he is. Um, so it's an age old question. Now, for the Protestants, in fact, the way they're going to answer this is, well, ultimately, man is not made good. So God's grace, so to speak, is something that's entirely external to man. He's not inwardly renewed, in fact. Um, so the joint declaration will say that um, um, yeah, that the, 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 um, somebody who's been redeemed is at one and the same time, both redeemed and a sinner. What right. that means is on the outside, God reputes them as just by merits of Christ, but inwardly, inwardly, they're still the same fundamentally flawed, broken creature. And, you know, it's, it's what leads that a fairly famous, uh, unfortunately, was not actually able to find it, but fairly famous, um, you know, phrase that's usually attributed to Luther, that man is no covered dung. Outwardly, looks pretty. Inwardly, stinky. Uh, um, so it's a pious fiction, ultimately. So to quote um, Luther, he says that it's, this is a really striking thing. He, he writes this on faith in, in a work called Faith and Works. He says, yes, this confidence in faith must be so high and strong that the man knows that all his life and works are nothing but damnable sins before God's judgment. And it is written, in thy sight shall no man living be justified. And he must entirely despair of his works believing that they cannot be good except through his faith, which looks for no judgment, but only for pure grace, favor, kindness, and mercy. So think about that. Everything you do is damnable. I mean, just if you really and deeply internalize that, how much self-hatred there must be, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's interesting there because you, you always have that dynamic 
You must entirely despair of its works, believing that they cannot be good except through this faith. That could lead to the indication, maybe, that his faith is somehow due to him. But that's not the case, ultimately. Because that would imply that even that act of faith is a work that's coming from his free will. But that's he denies that. So that nor is that an intrinsically good action. It's just you know something inspired by God that might be a sign that God's been pleased with him. A little bit later in that same um, work, he says, Thus our works forgiven are without guilt and are good, not by their own nature, but by the mercy and grace of God, because of the faith which God trusts on the mercy of God. So they're intrinsically bad, but they're imputed as good, they're taken as good, as man trusts that God is kind to him. Right. So, so no matter what we try to do, even if we're trying to do the right thing, at the end of the day, our works cannot be anything but bad. And it's only yep. because of God's grace that they are seen as good by him. Correct. Yeah. And that grace is just his, okay. it's not from a Catholic point of view, grace is a quality that both purifies the soul and elevates it to be able to act as God does. For Luther, it's merely ultimately, God's good pleasure. You know, he says, I want to like you. You're, you're hateful. Everything you do is damnable, but I choose to like you. Okay. And maybe one or two Which further. Which immediately brings up the, the I was just going to say, immediately brings up the next kind of the, the next question, which I know we're going to get to, but yeah. well, why is God choosing me to, to like why doesn't he choose everyone? And then we get into predestination. But sorry, I'm probably jumping yep. way ahead. Oh, no worries. Well, I mean, yeah, that's it's, it's in fact, it's not complicated. That really is all it is. I mean, if you just boil it down to its basics, it's an arbitrary choice of God from all eternity. This person is going to go to heaven. This person is going to go to hell. Nothing to change that. And mm-hmm. nothing in them that contributes to that fundamentally. Right. Um, and just like I was going to say, there's, there's a few um, quotes. Again, this is from an article of the person that I quoted last time from Miss May Smith, you know, just kind of trying to delve into original sin, but then also the consequence, what that means for our works. She writes that in this work on the Romans, Luther also works out the sinfulness of believers. One of the reasons Luther was so radical, he's going to the root of the question, is related to his second assertion that an active, sinful nature still operates in a believer. And therefore, a person can be both simultaneously saved and a sinner. You know, again, they're still actively sinful. Their nature is actively sinful. Um, and, and she quotes a document put together by some Protestants in Belgium, Belgian Confession, where it says, as, as a root, original sin produces a man all sorts of sin. It is, therefore, and here, nature of man, so vile and abominable in the sight of God that it is sufficient to condemn the human race. And this is the fundamental point. It is not abolished nor eradicated even by baptism. For sin continually streams forth like water welling up from this woeful source. Baptism doesn't make you good. <laughs> You're still a sinner. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. Like it's, you know, I'm sure you dealt with this with some of your kids, you know, sometimes as they grow up and, you know, maybe getting their terrible twos or something like that, they do all sorts of stuff. That's like, why are you doing that? Um, and uh, I remember a story of one of my friends who was babysitting um, a little child of a mutual friend of ours. It was about, I think there's a little girl, maybe two years old or something at the time. And anyway, she was playing with a little book and, and, and he could tell you get that mischievous look in her eyes. And she, she kind of looks at him and she, he tells her, don't you dare. She looks right at him and goes, don't. <laughs> and, uh, and so every once in a while, you know, he kind of joked like, oh yeah, I don't think the baptism took, you know? Um, yeah. But from. <laughs> it's all your fault, Father Loop. Good job. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, but this is what it comes down to is, I mean, from the Protestant point of view, it's like, no, no, actually that is what they are. They're evil. <laughs> yeah. Know, there's nothing about that. Um, yeah. 
in here, maybe again, just to show that this is not just from the beginnings, but to return to that joint declaration, which is, like I said, published in uh, 1997, if I'm not mistaken, but the late 90s. There again, they, they quote, to, to quote them, they say that Lutherans understand this condition of the Christian as being at the same time righteous and sinners. Believers are totally righteous in that God forgives their sins through word and sacrament and grants the righteousness of Christ, which they appropriate in faith. He grants it. He, may, he, he grants them this righteousness. But in Christ, oh, sorry, in Christ, they are made just before God, not in themselves, but through Christ. Looking at themselves through the law, however, they recognize that they remain also totally sinners. The concerns actually behaving well, interacting for the right reasons, I can't do it. Sin still lives in them. For they re repeatedly turn to false gods and do not love God with that undivided love which God requires as their creator. This contradiction to God is as such truly sin. Hmm. Um, yeah, they go on a little bit further. And say that thus when Lutherans say that a justified person are also sinners and that their opposition to God is truly sin, they do not deny that despite the sin they are not separated from God and that the sin is a quote-unquote ruled sin. Again, just I mean to understand that fundamentally it means that human nature is bad and cannot be fixed intrinsically, which is interesting and we'll come back why I say that. Okay. Um, now, just very briefly to speak about um, the Catholic position. The fundamental difference there is that not only does man cooperate in this choice, but through that and through God's forgiving grace, he is made intrinsically good and pleasing to God. So God is pleased with them not because of a pious fiction, but because we actually are made akin to him. It's like, it's, well, perhaps the easiest biblical quote for the moment is from St. John, behold the charity of God for us, that we should both be called and should be the sons of God. We are truly made God's sons, like unto him. You know, fundamentally for Luther, if he was consistent and he, you know, really thought through that, he would have to say, actually, St. John is wrong. We're just called the sons of God. Yeah. We're not, we are not truly sons of God. Now, again, I'll quote St. Thomas. And again, this is from question 113 in that first part of the Summa. He says that, secondly, justice is called in so much as it implies a rectitude of order in the interior disposition of man, insofar as what is highest is in man, let's say our reason and will, is subject to God, and the inferior powers, like our passions, our appetites, of the soul are subject to the superior, that is to, that is to reason. Okay, now this justice... Um, can be a man in two ways. We'll, we'll skip aside the first one because he's just talking about God creating Adam and making him just. But then secondly, this justice may be brought about in man by a movement from one contrary to the other. And in this way, justification implies a change from the state of injustice to the state of justice. And it is this way that we are now speaking of the, unjust, or of the justification of the ungodly. But to him that works, yet believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly. And because this movement is named, this movement of justification is moved to the term where to, in other words, where it ends up, rather than where it comes from, this change whereby anyone is moved by the remission of sins from the state of ungodliness to the state of justice, borrows its name from the term where to. And it's called justification. So in other words, they are made just intrinsically, interiorly. Okay, not just by a pious fiction. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? I mean, it might be good because it's obviously a little more technical, that language there, so to see if there's 
any question about that. So, so St. Thomas Aquinas is saying that, that God is moving us into a state of justice, mm-hmm. which and it, makes sense. Then go ahead. We'll finish your question to me. Um, okay. And then I, w- I was going to say, so if God is moving us to a state of unjust, uh, to a state of justice, then where do we fall in? Where is our role to play in this? Do we just need to maintain that state of justice through our works? Um, that's a good question. And it comes down to, let's say, perseverance in grace. There were two answers to that. So on the one hand, there is we can look at it from the point of view of a stable uh, disposition or habit, as it's called, of soul. In other words, that kind of resting position of the soul. What St. Thomas is saying is that this movement of uh, justification takes one from where their regular estate, their resting position is in injustice, is in this, let's say, um, this lack of order in the soul, where the mind is not subject to God and the lower powers are not subject to reason, to a state where that is the resting position, where things are poised to be there. The second part of that is actions. We have to maintain that by acting. Okay. And to every act that we are going to do that flows from that state of justice and nourishes that state of justice requires of God his grace. In other words, it's it's kind of like it's a continued motion. The first step, God invites, we say yes. To maintain that, God continually has to encourage us with his grace. And it's an uninterrupted series of yeses that we give to God that um, deepen that that status of our, or that disposition of our soul, the state of justice, make it more firm in us. And if you, it's, it's very similar to like, you know, you take a, uh, I don't know, just a, a basic skill that you have. I don't know if, um, if you mm-hmm. play any sports or, or anything like that, but it's the same thing. Sure. Ultimately, let's say a little kid up here, you know, hockey is a very famous or not famous, but a very, delighted sport for a number of the families and not a few of them, you know, get their kids out on the ice rink at two, three years old, you know, fundamentally the child is not choosing that. The parent is choosing that in that very, very rough analogy. The parent is taking the place of God initiating this action. Child cooperates because they get on the ice and they start moving, you know, and Mm -hmm. um, by continually doing that, they deepen that ability to say skate and obviously in the end play hockey and all that. You know, but it's by that with repeated actions right. that they nourish that. When if they stop playing for an extended period of time, they're, uh, those skills are going to wither and die. Similarly, here if we mm-hmm. if we stop, although it's because it's on a higher level, and that we need that in, that grace of God, that uh, first grace of God in all of our good actions. So He's offering. If we stop saying yes to that, even if we're not actively sinning at that point. We nevertheless dispose ourselves to fall into sin, if that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, and it's, it's kind of a constant thing. And it's, it's actually it's a very practical thing. I, one issue that often arises when people, let's say, will fall into a serious sin. You know, how do you think a lot of people tend by as a natural reaction respond to that like they've been making an effort and they fall into a serious sin what's kind of the natural reaction oh it's just you know give up what's the point what's the right. point of trying anymore exactly and it's you know very very human but in a way it's it's kind of um it's a huge thing to it's a huge problem because what happens there is the person, if they do yield to that and give up and you know, as a result commit more mortal sins, like what does it matter? I'm in a state of sin. Mm-hmm. What they do is they deepen those ruts of the sin in their soul. You know, make it more likely that they're going to have a heart, that, making it a longer battle to get out of it for two reasons. One, because of the yeah. sin itself, they just get more used to it. And it's they're training themselves how to react to, adver- how to, react to adversity, you know? It's like, well, whenever I right. have a problem, we're not I training just, themselves. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a, it's a positive training. I train myself whenever I have a uh, problem, true. I'm going to engage in self-destructive behavior, you know? And so when we do have a mm-hmm. problem, initial response, self-destructive behavior, but that's an aside. <laughs>
Yeah. So um, maybe just to <clears throat> again quote the Calso Trent briefly. It's a beautiful statement in session six of that same, uh, well, of the same session where <clears throat> the, the council fathers uh, write that this disposition or preparation is followed by justification itself, which is not remission of sins merely, but also the sanctification and the renewal of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and of the gifts, whereby man of un from unjust becomes just, and from being an enemy becomes a friend, so that he may be an heir according to hope everlasting. It's a beautiful, beautiful thought. And one that's utterly impossible for the Protestants. Utterly impossible. Because they're intrinsically bad still. They cannot be God's friend. Right. You, know, the, you have that all that you know, modern language. I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. But if they are consistent with the principles and roots of their religion, that doesn't mean anything. They can't be his friend. You know? Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> So, yeah, fundamentally, and as a consequence of that, what that means for this question of faith versus works, sometimes I think it's hard for people to understand because they, they kind of look at it as a contest between two categories, in fact, of works. They wouldn't use that terminology, but that's really what it is. For the Protestants, the only work that, the only work that matters is faith. Whereas for Protestants or for Catholics, you have to do all these, you have to follow all these rules and those are your works. That's not the issue. Realistically, in fact, the real question is that faith is merely this blind act of trust in God, which does not merit anything from God. It's merely at best a sign that God is in, in the saddle of you. So it's not merit anything. It's just you're making this act of confidence in him. You know, right. And here, just to quote very briefly, John Calvin and his Institutes of the Christian Religion, that we shall now have a full definition of faith if we say that it is a firm and sure knowledge of the divine favor towards us, founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ and revealed to our minds and sealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't say it's a trust so much as a firm and sure knowledge of the divine favor towards us. So it's not a merit. God is pleased with us or he's giving us his favor, but it doesn't fundamentally change anything. And obviously faith for a Catholic is, well, it's just the ascent of the mind, the truths that God has revealed. That is meritorious. You know, we actually merit from God by trusting, by accepting that he knows what he's talking about, you know, in revealing these truths to us. Um, okay. And so finally, just to come back to this question of works, there's no aspect of merit on the part of the Lutherans. Uh, so once more, just maybe in the final time to quote this joint declaration, um, it says there that the concept of a preservation of grace and a growth in grace and faith is also held by Lutherans, but in a very different way than Catholics. They do emphasize that righteousness is acceptance by God and sharing in the righteousness of Christ is always complete. Okay, so at the same time, they state that there can be a growth in its effects in Christian living. In other words, man can be more and more moved by God. When they view the good works of Christians as the fruits and signs of justification and not as one's own merits, they nevertheless also understand eternal life in accord with the New Testament as unmerited reward and the sense of fulfillment of God's promise to the believer. So theoretically, if God is a control, a person is going to do more and more of the things of God, but it has nothing to do with merit. It's not their free choice. They're not being made good and capable of that. So it, it is interesting. It's um, 
I was, when I was in college, I had, I had a good friend who, who's Lutheran and, and I, as, as a very, uh, uneducated Catholic at, at the point, at the time, I hadn't gone through the apologetics, uh, podcast yet. Mm-hmm. It was 20 some years ago, um, Fair enough. but I, I asked him the question, I said, you know, what's the point of, uh, what's the point of you doing good works? It doesn't matter. And he got very upset when I asked the question. Uh, and he said, because I love Jesus, why would I want to do things that are bad if I love Jesus? You know, that, that was kind of his answer. That was his, his idea. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. Jesus wants me to be good. So I am, yeah, my works don't mean anything, but I still want to do the right thing because I love Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, and for him, it was very simple. It was, it was a simple explanation. Uh, but it's still lacking that, that idea of that, that your works actually mean something. For him, right. it was more of just a symbol. Right, right. Okay, that's interesting. And I mean, on a certain level, there's a certain nobility in that answer. I like that, you know, in the sense that, yeah, you know, ultimately, and that in a properly understood, you know, should be the what motivates a Catholic to, to want to do this. I, I, want, I want to show yeah. my love for our Lord. In fact, our Lord himself says it. If you love me, obey my commandments. Um, right. The difficulty, of course, you know, if, and again, like I was saying a little earlier, for a lot of people, it's really hard to drive home to its logical conclusion, Luther's doctrine or Calvin's doctrine, to really, really accept it for all that it implies. Um, because frankly, you know, um, from Luther's point of view, if we accept him on face value, it's fundamentally impossible for a, a human being to love Christ. Because that implies a friendship that implies it's good. Whereas everything in us is so corrupt that right. every movement of our will, which is the seed of love, is evil. You know? So if he wants to yeah. have a real love and friendship with our Lord, ultimately, someone like that, you know, the real way for him to be able to live that is with the Catholic teaching, which says, yeah, it is possible for you to love God. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, anyways, maybe just kind of as a one or two consequences here. Like, again, with the question of predestination, it's not, it's, it's kind of, that's just a consequence of everything that we've seen so far. If man's nature is so fundamentally mm-hmm. corrupt, if he can do nothing to cooperate with his uh, justification, then all that remains is this arbitrary choice of God. You know, whereby, yeah, doesn't matter what you do. Um, you're fundamentally either saved or damned before you're even born, you know? Right. So again, that's just more of a consequence of these things. But what I think is, is what's also interesting is that I think Luther's doctrine, you know, because it effectively denies man's free will in some respects, um, or that it's part of his nature really has some pretty profound impacts on, let's say modern history and modern political thought. You know, a lot of, let's say, so on the one hand, man's free will does not contribute to man's moral formation. And it's not a, it's not an expression of his nature, but it's somehow opposed to it. And on the other hand, man Mm -hmm. is not made good or bad within, but by external forces. Um, What that's going to do, I would say, and this is just a broad assertion, it merit a lot more discussion than we have time for now. But as a broad assertion, I would say that once after that, once a belief in God began to wane, and that was very prompt in a lot of Protestant countries, like by the 1700s, 1800s, especially amongst the educated classes, it's just like people could not reconcile this with the notion of the goodness of God. But the the sense of what man was um, kind of stayed the same in the sense that man is going to be made good or bad by an external force. If you, were, if you drop God, what remains? What's the external force that's going to shape man? Uh, in the Protestant view, there's not going to be very much. Sure. But what, or what you can get is the state, society. Society. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So thinkers, to some extent like Rousseau, but more like Hegel and Marx, are going to take that vision. Yeah. And basically say, okay, we can reshape man because is, you just replace God and the devil with different uh, economic, for example, if you look at Marx, different economic stratas. 
that's just going to shape men, uh, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's a lot of consequences in it. Um, outside of this question of the fact that it just leads to despair, frankly, and a hatred of God, you know, God is bad because he's created a situation where I am alienated from him and there's nothing I can do about that. You know, I'm fundamentally evil in his eyes. It is interesting as, as, as I'm thinking through this more, it's the, the the Protestant idea has basically removed God from the equation Mm -hmm. in terms of being involved with, uh, your day-to-day life or in terms of, of uh, the impact of your day-to-day life on your own salvation. Mm-hmm. And that's going to leave a vacuum in yep. any man's mind, yep. meaning then he's got to find the cause or the root reason for doing something in something else. And then we get into, maybe I'm way oversimplifying it, but then we get into society. Well, I have to do it to, in order to be a good member of society. I have to do it to yeah. fight against this aspect of society, something like that. Yeah. It's also, it can contribute a lot, uh, let's say to this, and because of what you were saying there, it can contribute to the tendency of man to want to put up a facade. Like I'm fundamentally deeply yeah. bad and evil and I will never be anything different. But, and if I'm convinced of that, nevertheless, I have to live with my neighbors and I have to give them the impression that I'm good outwardly. You know, so, so I have to so, act good. You have to act good. You have to put up a front, and which doesn't fundamentally make you good. Um, and it creates a division of mind in people. Um, you know, it's, and it's something that oftentimes we'll deal with more, I think, even amongst, I think we Catholics in this country and probably in other Protestant countries as well are affected by that to some extent. Whereby, you know, we're willing to act in one way before the priest in a completely different way at home. Because you know, I'm I'm presenting a front, and it, it's not like they're fundamentally sitting down and thinking, "Well, I'm intrinsically bad, and there's something I can do about it." But I want to impress Father. But it's it's, right. it's a deep, deep subconscious way of looking at things, and not being integral. It's like I am who I am, which is I'm been right. inwardly renewed by by grace and by God and His free gift. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, just as an aside, I'm the the handout I have is a little bit, I think, out of order from where we are. So, uh, were mm-hmm. there any other major points you wanted to touch, or should I kind of uh, lead you towards wrapping it up? Or no, I think at this point, and I apologize about that. I think I got waylaid myself no, I, a little bit, but uh, no, I, I think in a way that kind of, from my point of view, draws it to that conclusion in the sense that you know ultimately it's why Protestantism is so deeply blasphemous against God. Because, you know, it basically says that God has put us in a situation where we're fundamentally evil and he will not do anything to draw us out of that. And that's necessary, quote unquote, to maintain God's liberty and his honor. Um, as opposed to the greater greatness of God, whereby he's able to take something, you know, fragile, broken creature such as man is, and not only to heal him by his grace, but also positively to make him good and a reflection of his own being and capable, therefore, of acting in a way that pleases him intrinsically, um, which is what we see in the saints. They please God, ultimately because of that grace they receive, but by their cooperation with that grace and not right. just by an arbitrary choice. And it is really a, a greater thing when we meditate on it. It's it's It would be easier for God to act as he does in the Protestant understanding of just putting a cloak over everything uh, in, yeah. in the true understanding of it. He is, he is healing and continuing to work and u- utilizing the works of creatures for his own glory, which is a greater thing. Right. Exactly. He makes us able to, let's say, practice virtues, become good, become better, be more and more faithful sons. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it has this great profound peace and um, real affection between the creature and its creator that flows from the truth of the matter, as opposed to that heresy of Protestantism. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Father, thank you so much for taking the time to go through all this with us. It's been uh, very eye-opening and, and appreciate the discussion as always. No, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Apologetic Series on the SSPX podcast and on our YouTube page. 
please consider subscribing to the YouTube account and the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. And please consider leaving a rating or a review on this podcast. This will help to make sure more people can find this podcast and discover the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism. Until next time, thank you for joining us and God bless you.